Welcome everybody and good evening. I'm Hava Leipzig-Holzauer and I run the Konar Center for Tolerance and Jewish Studies here at Nazareth College. Um, I would like to welcome Beth Paul, our, our um, Nazareth College president, who I see as on the Zoom here and, and thank everybody for their time this evening. We're gathering together for the next 90 minutes to stand together in solidarity with our Asian American Pacific Islander and international communities. Observable hate, racism, and bias has increased dramatically against AAPI persons in the US since the COVID-19 pandemic began. According to the Stop AAPI Hate Reporting Center, between March of 2020 and February of 2021, the center received almost 4,000 reported incidents. And that which is being reported is likely only a fraction of actual incidents. There have also been numerous violent attacks, including recently in Atlanta, where six Asian women were murdered, and one recently in New York City, where an Asian senior was attacked while onlookers looked away. They were fired today, by the way. I don't know if anybody saw that in the news. An analysis released by the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at California State University, San Bernardino, found that while hate crimes decreased overall nationwide in 2020 by 7% last year, those targeting Asian people rose by nearly 150%. So the total number down 77%, but those targeting Asian persons rose by 150%. So I would like to make clear that many who identify AAPI and or international have not personally faced such extreme racism, yet some have, and many others have experienced something in between. Each of our lived experiences is our own. And although we may like identify, it certainly does not mean that we like experience. Today, several members of the Nazareth community are participating as panelists and will share their experiences, suggestions, and wisdom. As participants and attendees in this program, we are here with an ear towards listening, learning, and raising awareness. It is incredibly important that in raising awareness, we plant seeds, seeds upon which we grow a deeper understanding of one another, a deeper sense of empathy, and a stronger pull towards action, meaningful action, which will lead to great and long lasting change. Nazareth's Office of Community and Belonging, as collaborators with the cultural centers on campus, including the centers collaborating for this program, is working with the same intention. Our broad objective through raising awareness and planting seeds is to bring greater equity and greater inclusion into our shared community. Hate, distrust of the other is taught and the greatest antidote is personal connection. So I hope that today we build more and we build stronger connections. And now I'd like to introduce our GA, Mackenzie Derrider. Hello everyone, I'm Mackenzie. I work as a graduate assistant for both the Konar Center of Jewish and Tol of Tolerance and Jewish Studies and the community, community and Belonging Department. I'm currently a graduate student at NAS studying higher education and student affairs. Later in the program, our panelists will answer questions. Please use the chat function in order to direct questions to the panel moderators. I would like to thank our numerous panelists from Nazareth College for participating today to help raise awareness in our community. We have several NAS students joining us today, including Iris Yang, Iron O, and Tara Mitsurasu. We will hear more about and from them later in the program. I'd also like to thank the faculty and staff who are participating as panelists and the moderators in today's program. These include Dr. Samuel Song, Director of the English Language Institute and Director of the Asia Pacific Rim Initiatives in the Stu Center for International Education, Aldi Prianto, Coordinator and Alumni Engagement, Dr. Nevin Fisher, Associate Vice President for Global Programs and Executive Director for the Center of International Education, and Ashley George, Assistant Director for the Advocacy and Social Justice Education and Diversity and Inclusive Excellence Education. 
We just heard from Hava, Executive Director of the Corner Center for Tolerance and Jewish Studies, and Dr. Mohammed Shafiq, Executive Director of the Hickey Center for Internet Interfaith Studies and Dialogue, will deliver closing remarks. Now I would like to introduce our panelists, Dr. Aya Zhang. Dr. Zhang is a faculty member of history at the University of Rochester. She received her BA from the Random University of China and her PhD from University of California, San Diego. She has taught 14 different Asia-related courses and is completing a book manuscript on modern China's foreign borrowing from America. Her past awards include Anne Wong Postdoctor Fellowship at Harvard's Fairbanks Center and an American Council of Learning Societies, a CLS fellowship, and an Abraham J. Carp Teaching Award at the University of Rochester. As a teacher and scholar, she has also systematically tested the integration of scientific math map making into undergraduate research and has attracted 257 students from 53 majors to experiment outside of their comfort zones. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Zhang. So should I start? Okay, so yeah, this is such an important meeting and I feel honored to be And so I understand that there is a time limit of 14 minutes and so I'm going to use my 15 minutes timer to make sure that I don't take up more time of this meeting here. So, um, so we'll see how much we can do. See, because there are 24, you know, different ethnic groups in terms of Asian Americans. If you divide it by 14, that's roughly 30 second per uh, per group. <laughs> so we'll see what we can do here. <laughs> so I would like to I prepare a very oh uh, like um, uh, Hava, can you can you allow the share screen function if possible? Yeah, so I prepare a few uh, a few yes. PowerPoint slides. Yeah. Trish, I might need your help with that. Or if Evan wants to describe. So I can start, you know, why yeah, uh, my timer is running here. Yeah. So in terms of Asian Americans, I think, you know, first a definition. Yeah. And I think broadly speaking, is Asian Americans are people who can trace, you know, trace their roots to countries through East Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. So specifically, the, the groups, in total there are 24, I'm, I cannot name more of them, but the groups, you know, the main groups are Chinese, Japanese, Indians, Filipinos, Koreans, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Vietnamese, Taiwanese, Cambodians, Laotians, yeah, and then also the, the more people. Oh, I can share. Yeah, so um, I think we probably still need to enable the share function here. I wonder, is it possible to share this? It screen? should work now. I just, yeah, you should now. be all set. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. So this is the broad definition here. And when I was, um, when I was thinking about what I can say in 15 minutes, and I think instead of going into each group, and then uh, I would like to talk about law. Yeah, American law, immigration law. So when I trace the history of American immigration law, and I think there are four landmark points that affect Asian Americans as a total, as 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 a group, you know, yeah, as a whole group. And I would like to, you know, use this time to briefly trace it. Yeah. So the very first one I would like to mention is 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act. And this one is important in a sense that it's the very first federal immigration law to ban entry based on race or nationality. This so is the very first one. But by then, the Chinese was not the only people, you know, the only foreigners who coming in, you know, the, the Irish, the Italians, and then, you know, the, the Europeans, they're all coming in. But this is the very first time. So why the Chinese? The Chinese out of all Asians, were the very first one to arrive in America. So as early as 1848. And so that was during the gold rush. It was during the gold rush. And then later the construction of the continental, transcontinental railway between 1961 to 1965, you know, yeah, brought in more Chinese laborers. And how did the Chinese, at first the Chinese, I want to point out the transcontinental railway, the, the role of spreading Chinese across the United States. So we know that the transcontinental railway is started from two ends of America, one from the California end, the other from, from the East Coast, Omaha, starting from Omaha. 
and then they meet in the middle. So the western half was built by the Chinese and the eastern half was built by mostly Irish laborers. So what means that for the Chinese laborers, they started from California, but as the road was built, they were marching toward Central America, you know, the center part of America. They were promised a return ticket, a return train ticket once the railway was completed. However, when the railway was completed, the promise was broken. So now the Chinese coolies at the time, you know, they were stuck right in the middle of America, had nowhere to go. And that's why Chinese compared to other men group, you know, they really dispersed because they were stuck right there. So they went all directions. But when we get to 1882, the Chinese exclusion act was a combination. Before that, Chinese already been banned from public school, from being banned from owning property, and then being banned to defend themselves in court, and which and then finally it culminated into the Chinese exclusion act in 1882. So this is the first one. And then the second one is why in 1924, there will be an immigration act essentially was targeting Asian. Asian Americans after the 1882 exclusion act, it's extremely hard for Chinese laborers to come in, but the development of American West was still ongoing. And also the, the, the sugar plantation, the, the pineapple plantation in Hawaii still need laborers. If the Chinese, if no more Chinese can come, more Asians need to come. So that's when the Japanese enter the picture. Yeah, Japanese after 1868, after Meiji Restoration, the Japanese were allowed to travel abroad. So after 1868, the Japanese first arrived at Hawaii, and then they, they went to California. So the Japanese came as a second wave after the Chinese. What happened is there was not a exclusion act against the Japanese, but the Japanese essentially suffered the same fate as the Chinese. So by 1908, there was something called gentleman's agreement, which is not written into a law between, but the gentleman agreement is between Washington and Tokyo. Essentially, instead of having Washington banning Japanese immigrants from that end, the Tokyo, the Japanese government, they quietly agreed to not issue any visa for Japanese you know, immigrants to the United States. So cut off the source from that end. So 1908, now the Japanese were being stopped. What's the next? Koreans, yeah. So Koreans became the third group after 1906. For the Koreans, the Koreans has something unique, you know, which is make them different from the Chinese and Japanese. The Koreans, they come here as laborers, but many of them, they left their country is because as political refugees, yeah. The Chinese left poverty, the Japanese left poverty. The Koreans were leaving a country that was being occupied by Japan. Yeah. So they fled. They fled their country. They, they fled because they, they become political refugees and they came to the United States. They became the third wave of laborers after. But the Korean immigration was also banned in 1913. Then after 19, after the Koreans, what can be the next group? Because you know the fast-growing America was still searching in search of cheap Asian laborers, so after Korean was the Indians, yeah, South Asians. At the time, you know, at the time, both India and Pakistan were not two separate countries. They 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 did not become separate country until 1947. So for that time, it was you know it's the Punjab, you know, Punjab people, and both Indians and Pakistani. So starting from the 1910s, they they come in each group, the Chinese the Korean, the Indian, they suffer the same fate. Their children were forbidden from attending school. They were forbidden from owning land. Yeah, one after another. So by 1920s, the Asian population, you know, in America, yeah, in America, is already all together and reaching close to half a million. And then so at that time, yeah, at that time as a collective act in 1924, the immigration act was passed. So pretentiously, and this one, it was the official clause is that it limit the number of immigrants, you know, through a national origins quota. So here, this one, it means that it put a quota on each nation. And however, there is zero quota assigned to any Asian country. 
So there are quotas for Ireland, quotas for Italy, quota for Germany, but there's zero yeah, for Asian countries. So that effectively, the 1924 Act excluded, banned all Asian Americans at once, yeah, at once. And, and after that, can so the Asian Americans have to come in from from a very different route, you know, very difficult route. And then, for instance, if I take like uh, South Asian, for example, in 1919, the application rate. This is even before the 1924. The the acceptance rate, you know, yeah, was was 45 percent. Yeah, 45 percent. Only one and a half can be even accepted. So from 1924. 1930s and 40s, we saw very small flow in it. But right in there, there was a special group, Filipinos. See, still cheap Asian laborers, Chinese can come, Japanese can come, Koreans can, cannot come, Indians were being banned, Filipinos. Filipinos became the new source. Filipino has a special status. We know that Philippines became a colony of the United States in 1898, but Citizenship was out of question for Filipinos. The status they were granted we call U.S. nationals. So U.S. nationals means that they can travel to any parts of the United States and then without being restricted uh, by the immigration law. Yeah, by the immigration law there. So it means that Filipinos can travel. So that's why the Filipinos became, you know, before nineteen, before World War II, the last wave of laborers. Asian laborers that arrived at the United States. But even, even, the, even the Filipinos were stopped in 1934. In 1934, because in 1934, the agreement was signed to allow Philippines to become independent. So that signed, which is, which is great, you know, for the, 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 the fate of the Philippines as a nation, However, the Filipino in the United States, they overnight, they sunk into legal limbo. Because overnight, their status would change from US nationals to aliens. Yeah, and so by then when we look at, when we look at 1934, there was already, there were already 110,000 Filipinos really residing in the United States. Most of them were persuaded to go home, but few of them left. And so they were stuck there. They were stuck there. A lot of them chose to, you know, pursue the American dream by joining American army. Yeah, by joining the American army. So, so because that can expedite the process, you know, hoping to, to get a status in the United States. So that's roughly the state before 19, before World War II. And then the third one I would like to point out, this is in 1942. Yeah, in 1942, this is, this is one month after Pearl Harbor. Why this one is important? Because this one has one very specific target group, the Japanese. Yeah, this, this executive order was signed by FDR one month after the Pearl Harbor attack. And then the order, this is an order, it's not a congressional law. Yeah, it's an executive order, so later was repealed. So in, on the surface, this is what it allowed. It authorized the Secretary of War or military commanders to exclude any of all persons they feel needed to be excluded. Essentially, it put the Japanese under martial law, so they are not by. Then the end result. The end, the end result of that is about 436,000 you know, Japanese at the time, and they were, um, they were evacuated. Evacuated is a nice word. Or we call it, they were put they were put in uh, internment camp. Yeah, so they they were forced to leave their house, leave their home. Most of them reside in Washington, Oregon, and California. So they left all their belongings, you know, their their, their house. They boarded a truck, and then the truck kept driving toward east. In the end, you know, the truck was stopped, you know, in in the middle of Arizona, yeah, or in the middle of Nevada. And they will be in the middle of the desert. And there will be an internment. There will be an internment camp there. And then so that that internment that internment camp, you know, will be their home for the next four years. Yeah, for the next four years. This one later was ruled in 1980s. The Japanese sue. Yeah, you know, the Japan the, the, the Japanese American they sue U.S. government because this is unconstitutional. 
Yeah, this is an unconditional solution. Because out of the evacuees, 62% of them were US citizens. Yeah, 62% of the Japanese American who were thrown into the camp, they were US citizens. And yet, you know, they were being treated as the enemy of the state. So this is also one scenario, you know, yeah, that happened to Asian America, which is sometimes you see, you know, the, con the Congress can pass law, but executive order, you know, can also accomplish, yeah, okay, can be kind of attack toward one specific ethnic group in special time. So the last one, um, I'm looking at my timer, and I, we have probably have two minutes left. Yeah. So the last one I would like to talk about is 1965. This is watershed moment for Asian Americans, 1965, Lyndon B. Johnson. Yeah. And uh, so in the middle of the Vietnam War, 65, that was, um, that was right before he escalated the Vietnam War. Yeah. So what does the 19, what did the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act do? Yeah. What it did is abolished the national origins quota. Asian Americans became the group that benefited most from this act. Yeah, because finally Asians got a quota. Yeah, got a quota after this many years, got an official quota. So this first thing, it abolished the national origins quota, and then no group benefited more from this act than Asian Americans. And then the second one, which is very important, even relevant to today, is that it established the two principles of US immigration. One, based on family reunification. Yeah. And then the second one is based on professional skills. So those two standards has been upheld all the way till today. Yeah. And those two benefited Asian Americans. Yeah, in terms of these categories. But the third one I would like to point out is, this is a great moment. This is a great moment for Asian Americans, but sadly, this, this is not a good moment for um, immigrants from Latin America, especially from Mexico. Because what it did is that it, it established a global cap on what we call the immigration, you know, immigrants from Western hemisphere for the very first time. It put a cap on immigrants from Western Hemisphere. So the one that directly was affected is Mexico and then the countries south of it. And that, you know, later contributed to the current problem of illegal immigrants. Yeah, you know, from that part, you know, the, others, the other side of the continent. So out of this four, those are the four moments and then I don't have time, but I do prepare, you know, in the, so for the Q&A part, I do prepare. So I look into each group for, today, uh, for today's event. So I look into each group. I look into each group story, the Chinese story, the Japanese story, Korean story, Indian story, Filipino, Filipino story. And then, you know, the Vietnamese, Cambodians, Laotians, and those, those, the, the, so here we can roughly draw a line of 1965 right here. So after 1965, yeah, the Asian American, you know, immigration in the 1970s are mostly related to war, to civil war in those countries. Yeah. And the story of Hong Kongese and Taiwanese, and that were later related to what we call, you know, the, the, the Chinese territorial disputes. So I have uh, I have notes on all this ethnic group. And later in Q&A part, if, um, if anyone would like to know more, I can share, yeah. But for now, my time is up and I would like to stop right here, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Chang. And I, you know, I'm thinking possibly maybe my, one of my emails must have been very scary about time, but I apologize and I know we could learn so much from you. So I hope you, you will stay with us and be part of the panel so we can ask you more questions and learn more as we go along. Well, um, and you already taught me so much already. To have, to, to have 15 minutes to participate in this event. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Really, just, just looking at the incredible diversity within that term, I, I've already learned, learned a ton. So I'd like to um, welcome our moderator, um, Dr. Nevin Fisher, from here at NAS. 
Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. And I'd really like to give a special thanks to the five uh, Nazareth community members, uh, one faculty member, one staff member, and three students to share their lived experience with, with us of their time in the United States. And we'll open up this evening with uh, Dr. Song, Sam Song. And if each participant could spend three to five minutes talking about your experiences, I know it's just sort of skating across the surface with such a short amount of time, but then I hope we can begin to go in a little bit deeper as we get to the Q&A afterward. So Sam, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, I remember now I unmute myself, right? Yes. Okay, good. Just to clarify, I uh, send an email to uh, Hover, just say, do I have seven minutes or five minutes? I got a seven minute. So you got it. I use my timer, <laughs> just like uh, Dr. John uh, did. Okay, start. Good evening, everyone. And I uh, just uh, so honored to have this opportunity. And a very uh, brief self-introduction. I'm associate professor from School of Education. And uh, at the same time now, currently I'm serving as a, a senator representing diversity group on campus. So I think uh, today I got uh, the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, also special thank you to uh, Professor uh, John, as I just said, for providing this uh, one, uh, this, uh, very succinct, but a very good, thorough uh, historical review of the issue nowadays we still have to deal with. Thank you. But uh, uh, to start uh, my presentation today or sharing today, I would also like to, to extend my heartfelt thanks to uh, Professor uh, uh, Shafi and the team members at um, Connor Center for Tolerance and Jewish Studies, uh, like Haver and Trish, thank you for putting together this uh, very meaningful and uh, important uh, event. And also thank you for inviting me to share my thoughts uh, with regard to this uh, very important issue. Today, I think uh, what I'm going to, to do, to your surprise, I would just say, instead of, uh, as Nevin just mentioned, the lived experience, since uh, I'm that type of person, not only because of my personality, and also because uh, a lot of other factors are living in me, and I think I have more positive and a healthy uh, experience than I thought I could have uh, in terms of this um, anti-Asian um, sentiment. Um, of course, uh, with that being said, after carefully examining, because I was assigned the task, so I, I have to very carefully re, uh, just examine and re-examine and reflection. And then I and talked with my uh, constituent. And I think collectively we did find some areas we believe we can jointly together, we can jointly just help improve. Um, with regard to this racial discrimination concern on campus or in the larger community in Rochester. And due to the time constraint, I'll just share a couple of points here. And then uh, uh, just like uh, Professor John mentioned, I, we can talk more uh, during the Q&A sessions and try to be uh, conscious about my time. So the first thing I would like to talk about this um, uh, bias, not hate, just bias. And, and that will be cultural 
misunderstanding. And I think cultural misunderstanding is a big piece for me, based on my personal experience. I've been in this country for 20 plus years, and I love American people. Everyone I encounter, and I think uh, they are very generous and very friendly and very, uh, just uh, to me, I just uh, feel, I, I don't have anything inside me against them or say they against me. I don't have that kind of experience. So I have to be honest. But as I said, sometimes uh, misunderstand lack of understanding uh, of cultural differences, oftentimes just uh, create some tension or, or just uh, uh, issue here and um, as we know, just one example here, as we know, uh, the essential components of a culture, when we say culture, we know culture actually essentially include uh, the products, the perspectives and practices. And if we miss, uh, if we do not understand this uh, essential components of culture, we probably will, you know, just uh, consciously or subconsciously uh, misunderstand or sometimes even mistreat others, uh, peoples from other cultures. So, as I said, I'll give you example, <laughs> this example, my colleagues and my friends will probably, probably will uh, just will, uh, make fun of it. Just so be it. Let me uh, just uh, share this example. I not here uh, at Nazareth, but also in all, you know, just various uh, institutions I worked with. I've studied in California and Minnesota, Maryland, and now New York. And I find something in very common just because misunderstanding or lack of communication. And people just uh, make some uh, light joke. Uh, example in case will be about uh, some very dear friend uh, just uh, benignly joke about the garlic order coming out of uh, <laughs> um, just their Asian colleagues or, or students. And sometimes they even display a manifest reaction um, toward a different type of cologne from another ethnic group because uh, I got this from uh, that group. And as much as this is very innocent, I know I'm, part, uh, I'm the part of uh, American friends. And as much as this is innocent, implicit, actu implicit uh, bias actually arises because they feel it. Uh, just imagine in your head, just imagine you go to another culture. Oh, oh, sorry, seven minutes already? That's too fast. Um, and then I'll just leave it there and also communicative uh, competence deficit related challenges. I will talk more about it if I have a chance. And to end uh, uh, this, since uh, my time is up, just to end this, I will just, um, um, the final conclusion, a final part of my reflection, I just want to share with you uh, about what Confucius famously mentioned about four things we each should make effort to avoid, which is foregone conclusions, arbitrary predeterminations, uh, obstinacy, and egoism. The experiences I just mentioned, and I'm going to mention if I have a chance, um, could have been avoided if we carefully heed uh, this warning from Confucius. We know no one is better than others. We are just different from each other. And to end this uh, reflection, uh, th this uh, sharing, I just want to um, end it uh, on a very positive note. That is what we have seen from our senior leadership trying so hard to accomplish, namely to turn the campus uh, culture into an environment where everyone is encouraged to be part of the community. 
uh, to best capture this environment, I would like to conclude my presentation um, with the inspiring remarks delivered by our current president, um, college president, Paul. Quote, let's continue to work together to support an inclusive learning and working environment where we work, respect, support all community members. Each person's lived experience is honored. In line with that charge, I would go further by suggesting above all, we show each other a genuine love, genuine love by embracing the differences each bring to this wonderful community. Thank you for allowing me just to go a little extra minutes. Thank you, Sam. Our second speaker is um, going to be Iris Young. Iris, are you here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? There you are. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Yu Hui Yang, and you can also call me Iris. Um, well, it has been two years since I first stepped on the land of United States. I can say that I have experienced a lot, but I can either say that I have experienced very little. Um, actually, I've talked about a lot of my own experiences last time. So today, instead of talking about my own experiences, I would, look, I would love to express my own observations and views on the recent frequent attacks of Asian Americans. Um, at present, there are about uh, 19 million Asian Americans living in the United States, including international students like, oh, excluding international students like me. And Asian Americans are called model minorities in American society. In other words, Asian Americans are regarded as a good minority because they are usually well-educated, love studying, have a strong sense of family, and usually have um, decent jobs and incomes. On the other hand, although we have been suffering from many racial discriminations in the process of living in the United States, we usually don't complain. I'm talking about exposing this to the outside world. We are very quiet about it, or even a little submissive, if you ask me. However, the recent um, malicious attacks on Asian Americans have all taken place in broad daylight, focusing on the elderly and female Asian Americans. At first, a Thai Amer American was just walking on the road in San Francisco. Suddenly, he was pushed to the ground from behind by a young man. Then he was seriously injured and died. He's 91 years old. Then in Brooklyn, another guy knocked down a 68-year-old Chinese woman. There were three shooting incidents in Atlanta, and six of the eight dead were Asian women. Although the law enforcement has not confirmed the motivation, we all know that this is a hate crime against Asian Americans. The more I search for the things, more and more cases pop up, and I can even count. Many of the cases have video recording of the incident process. I can't bear to see it. Um, what's going on? Why are these things happening more and more intensively? Some people blame education for these things, but I don't really agree with this. Five years old, we had a former president who was an obvious, obvious xenophobic, who often used words and sentence, sentences of hatred to express his views of specific groups. His followers and audience will listen and absorb these ideas they will take what he says seriously. And in addition, because of the epidemic, there are already 500,000 deaths in the United States and stay at home order is still in progress. Many people know, uh, don't have a work at all. And of course, many people have lost their jobs because of the epidemic and urban closure is still in progress. Um, people's feelings are becoming crazy and easy to manipulate it. So now the simplest solution is to take the former president as an example to shift the responsibility to others, innocent people. As a result, Asian Americans living in the United States have become the perfect scapegoats. Is it rare for Asian Americans to be used as scapegoats, discriminated against and attacked it in the United States? Actually not. And the rampant epidemic is not the fault of a certain minority group. We all know that. But I was still shocked when the selfish, bullying, and crazy dark side of many people's human nature showed up in facing of these setbacks. 
these things make Asians or even other minority groups in the United States feel insecure. I once talked about this with my friends. Um, and what she said to me made me sad. She said that uh, when she was walking on the streets, she would be very scared, afraid that someone would suddenly jump out and abuse her or attack her, even if she did nothing. And so it is with me. No matter where inside or outside of the campus, hate crimes like this should be stopped and despised. But if we meet up with this kind of hate crime, what can we do to stop it? Let's not be silent anymore. Whether it is you or me, Asian people or other, any other ethnic groups, when you witness this kind of violence, even harassment or discrimination, the first thing to do is to expose it. Because if the officials can hear or see such things, they won't try to do anything. But if we've got enough clear evidence, they cannot escape and ignore the existing problem anymore. As far as I know, the police in, United, uh, in New York and San Francisco have set up special teams to conduct regular patrols in areas where Asian Americans live so as to better in, uh, ensure the safety of people's travel. And similarly, if you witness or encounter such hate speech or behavior in school, please don't hesitate or be afraid. Expose them and talk about this to the people around you, your teachers or counselors. I know it may be difficult at the beginning, but we should all have confidence because things are changing slowly and all of us should unite and work on it slowly. One day our efforts will be rewarded and we will be able to harvest a more friendly living space. Thank you. Iris, thank you so much for your moving words and just for encapsulating this moment that we live in now. Uh, I would also like now to ask uh, Yelen O, Irene O, if she would speak to her experience. Uh, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Yelen O, and you guys can call me uh, Irene. And uh, I'm a Chinese student at NAS. So uh, I'm currently a sophomore student in the math department. And I have something to say due to the Asian people attacked and caught into the state recently. I'm so disappointed and heartbroken that here are no longer like what I expected and what I heard about before I come here. Uh, when people talk about American in China before, people will think of Hollywood movie, Disney, Oscar, NASA, NBA. And in a country with healthy multicultural advanced technologies, high education, both those factors br bring me here. However, since COVID-19, the discrimination and assaults against Asian have been exposed. Lot of Asian people were born and raised in the state, or their grand grandparents were living here for uh, 100 years ago, just like yours. Those in Kazakhstan Asian people are suffering the hate virus, like the everyone and everywhere they're suffering in violence is from haters. Also, I think. Uh, I'm so lucky that all my American friends are so nice to me and they are friendly, kindly, open-minded, but I had an experience before which I cannot forget, even if it's not attention-grabbing details. In our dining hall, and uh, as you guys know, there are several stuff in each window that help us to add food. However, it's Unbelievable that one staff has a significantly different educate to one Asians. When she adds to white students, African Americans, and other students from other countries, she was so nice and kind. But when she adds to Chinese students, she was indifferent. And even we spoke to her and she didn't answer us. I asked, how are you? And she didn't answer me. And I said, thank you. She didn't answer me too. So um, it's just to me that the experience of similar situations many Chinese students have. So during that time, many 
uh, Chinese students meet together and we observe and discuss how we should do. So finally, we decided to jointly report this to the director of the dining hall. But uh, to be honest, I don't know the, how about the results of this issue. Also, I'm so disappointed in my friend's experience, which he shared with me. Uh, I have a friend, uh, his name is Paul, and he was a Chinese American born in Philadelphia, and she, uh, he is a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania. Just before the U.S. election last year, there would be people on the buses posting the referendum advertisement, and every passenger would receive it before getting on the bus. But my friend Paul is the only Asian in a night, and there maybe have seven or eight people in front of him, but everyone received it before getting on the bus. However, the staff only escaped my friend and sent the paper to the people behind my friend. I think our culture teaches us to be tolerant, but I don't think it's a reason for discrimination. So we need to stand up and speak for our Asian people. Don't be afraid to say no to discrimination, Asian hate like American beauty again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuelin, for your words and for the pain that's behind them for being willing to share that with us. <clears throat> Uh, I would next like to ask uh, graduate student Tara Mitsuyasu to speak about her experiences. Hi, my name is Tara. I'm a grad student here. Um, I, I was very kind of lost when I was first asked to speak at this panel just because I feel like this topic is you can take decades to even talk about and kind of um, just analyze what is happening. I think it's much more complicated than um, people kind of assume. Like it's not just about people judging someone and hating on them for no reason. It's more com complicated and I think more psychologically rooted as well. Like I've learned in my psychology classes when I was um, in high school that, for example, um, if you don't spend much time with another group of like racial group, for example, um, they tend to see those the other group as kind of similar looking so when i was so for example when i i grew up in japan until the age of 18 and i came here for my undergrad studies and to me all americans look the same and like that might be like for some people that might be racist but I, I, it's just another very complicated issue to unpack is it possible to be racist against white population or whatnot because of the amount of power that's kind of um, imbalanced, I guess, because um, I assume if a white person said all Chinese people or all Japanese people or all Korean people look the same, that'd be extreme, extremely racist, right? There's like this kind of, um, I think, a complicated perspective to dissecting all of this. And I think there's no one right answer. There's kind of this gray zone that we really have to unpack in order to really dig into what the root of the problem is. And I don't think it's simple. And I think it requires a lot of discussion and it also needs to have intention. Like, why are we discussing this? Why do we want to talk about this? Is it because we want to blame the other person or is it because we want to defend ourselves? Or are we actually trying to solve something? And are we actually trying to make connections? And um, in my experience in the US, I've went to undergrad for four years and I worked as a teaching assistant for a year and I'm in my grad program. And this is, so it's like basically my sixth year living in the United States, but um, I have not experienced anything overtly racial. Like I haven't been called nasty things. Um, I, I feel like I had, I have gotten, as well as my friends have received a lot of microaggression. So microaggression is something that happens to you that is not overtly racist, but something that wouldn't happen to someone else. And it just, it doesn't bother you at, in one instance, but when it keeps happening, it becomes really, really um, 
kind of like a powerful statement to you. It, um, a lot of people like kind of um, use the analogy of a mosquito bite. One mosquito bite might not feel like a lot, but when you continuously get mosquito bites over and over and over again, it really does take a toll on you. And I think I'm gonna mix some of my experiences as well as other people I've talked to um, in where when I discuss this, but um, some of the experiences that um, I've had in the US are being asked, um, like, are you really from Japan, for example, like, um, because I'm half Indian, so I don't look <laughs> stereotypically Japanese. Um, so it, it kind of like, I have a very complicated self identity, <laughs> or kind of a perception of who I am, because even in Japan, I'm, I'm very like, there's so much microaggression against me because I don't look Japanese and it's such a homogenous culture that so many Japanese people don't perceive me as Japanese and they assume immediately that I don't speak Japanese. They talk in front of me about me without knowing that I can under understand them, things like that. So it's, it's really not just an American problem. It's really everywhere and it's not, it, it's really not. It's just, uh, I have so many experiences in Japan that really frustrate me and like, my dad, for example, who's in India, he gets stared at a lot. I'd get stared a lot in any public space. That's why I don't really like going there. Like, I don't like being in public spaces. Right here, I'm so used to people not staring at me. But when I go back, I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm the spotlight all the time. Like, I feel like I need to always look very good. I have to look a certain way and I have to behave in a very like professional way in order to present myself and be perceived as an okay person. And um, it's just, yeah, I'm sorry. I kind of lost track and I went to the Japanese side of my experience, but coming back to the US here, um, um, I think a lot of people have kind of talked to me and said, oh, wow, you don't have an accent. It's like, do I have to have an accent like to be from Japan? Like I went to an international school for my whole life. So maybe that's why I don't have an accent, but it's like, like, I, I don't know, like, I've talked to another person about this and um, she's actually a faculty in Nazareth and she's from Japan. And she, she, on the other hand, has an accent. And apparently in her experience, a lot of people ask her where she's from because of her accent. And she really doesn't like that. And she finds that disrespectful. And I, that's kind of interesting to me because not a lot of people ask me where I'm from if I don't, like, because I don't have an accent, I'm assuming. And when I talked to that faculty, we, we kind of discussed and said, if there was a completely white person from France who had a French accent speaking to you with a French accent, would that person real ask that person where they were from? So we have this like kind of like debate, like, do you think that person would be asked where they're from? Like, because they don't look different, they look white, you know, like, so I think it's just, it's so complicated. It's, um, I think, oh, I don't even know how to explain like my thought process here because it's just like a tornado in here. But um, it's just a very interesting topic to unpack. And the issue is with microaggression, I think many of it doesn't come from um, ill will. It's more like a curious, innocent question. Like, where are you from? Like, that that's not a bad question at all. Like, if you ask every single person when you met them, where are you from? That's not an issue. But if you direct it only towards people who look different from you, that becomes an issue. And, um, and I think um, the, the issue of, <laughs> I went to a friend's house for Thanksgiving. I love that family and I love them. And I love my friend for inviting me over for Thanksgiving when I couldn't go back home. Um, but <laughs> when I went to their grandparents' house, when they were cooking Thanksgiving meal, my friend's mom told the, the grandmother like, oh, she's from Japan. And she's like, oh my gosh, I have soy sauce and teriyaki sauce. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> like, I, I was like, but, like at that time I was like so shocked I was like I didn't know how to respond I was like oh my god what am I witnessing here like this is so stereotypical like oh my gosh like but later on now that I think about it it's like she was naturally just concerned about me she didn't know that that food would be something I could eat or something I was used to eating and so I think it also comes from what previous students have said it's just about getting to know each other being aware of 
cultural diversity and people around you and it's just learning about each other it's really that it that, that lack of um information knowledge or just ignorance in general can cause a lot of harm and so it's just getting to know each other but the issue is the world is getting more globalized every day right like there's just so much like people are coming from everywhere like i think like a long time ago there wouldn't be an international student from japan right like it's just the constant kind of um, globalization so much traveling so much um, interaction from um, different countries that's what gives more opportunity for such microaggression and racism to occur um, things that could have been okay before now it's not because there's just so much more traveling and so much more interaction between um, different people um, and um, I I personally feel like my biggest issue here was the concept of yellow fever. Um, I don't like the use of yellow either because I don't see Asian people and think they're yellow. I don't know, like, like, and then there's this whole like concept analogy of like bananas. Like, so some people who look Asian but are actually white inside, like, I'm like, what does that even mean? Like bananas? Like, why would you consider a human being to a banana? Like, it just does not make sense to me. But apparently, I mean, there's people who say that about African-Americans too. Like, she looks black, but she's white inside. Like, what does that even mean? Like, for me, it um, bothers me. But getting back to the concept of yellow fever, I just really find it so frustrating when people just objectify Asian women. And there's just, I think it's all over social media. It's in like a lot of Hollywood movies, just the hypersexualization of Asian women, like like strippers or Asians, like people who are, I don't know, like giving like sensual massages or Asian, like it's just like there's Asian actresses are typecast into this sexual like role in movies. And I think that's what kind of, um, reinforces that idea um, that Asian women are submissive, are very sexual, and I don't know. I, I honestly don't know why people have yellow fever, because I'm not um, I'm not them, and I don't know what makes them think that way, but I've had multiple advancements from, <laughs> advances from white people, white men who have, um, when I rejected them, <laughs> they would just immediately ask the next Japanese girl, you know, like, it's just like, wow, like, I see how it is, you know, like, I, they, they didn't see, they saw me just as an Asian woman, they didn't see me as nothing more, as anything more, and um, another thing I've encountered is I was kind of, I think I was, like, hanging out with a person I really didn't know, he was white, and he, um, it was just like late afternoon, he invited me over to his place and I just went to have a chat. And when I used their bathroom, there was like a whole group of guys and girls in the other room, I think. And I think I was the only Asian person there, I'm assuming, yeah. And I went to the bathroom and when I was leaving the bathroom, I heard their conversation when I wasn't there. And they were saying, oh, so where's Japan? So they were asking where I was. So like they called me Japan. And for me, I, I for some reason, Although that question might seem pretty innocent, I felt like I was in danger. Like, I don't know what it was, but I felt the need to run. Like I left the bathroom door and I heard, so where's Japan? And I immediately looked at like the door and I felt like running, but I was like, Tara, you gotta stay strong. You gotta face your fears. And I went back into the room and I had a very uncomfortable time. I don't know why I just didn't leave. Like I thought, I, now that I look back, I'm like, you're being like brave in the wrong places. <laughs> so like, I think I should have left, but um, it's just, I don't know. And I, I think that guy also took interest in me right after I told him I was from Japan, which also bothers me. Like, I feel like he wouldn't have been interested if I didn't tell him my background. So it's just this, just sexualization of um, Asian women, I think really bothers me. Um, but again, it's really not um, something that people do intentionally. I think racism and stereotypical just generalizations happen because of like who we are psychologically. Like, like if you've ever taken psychology classes, like you kind of like learn about the um, concept called schema. So if you go into a room 
you know what to expect from a certain room. You expect walls, you expect ceilings, you expect windows, you expect a desk. Like if you go to an office, you know what to expect there. If you go to a gym, you know what's there. It's because you've built the schema of what things are associated with. And human beings love to classify things and just make generalizations. That's how we survive. If we didn't know, we didn't have the ability to generalize and make those assumptions, we wouldn't be here. Like we, if we went outside, we wouldn't know how to drive a car or know the traffic rules. Like we wouldn't be able to survive daily life. And I think our talent, our ability to actually classify and generalize these information actually becomes a, a detriment when we associate with other people. And I think that's the issue. And it's just not black and white. It's just something that we just really have to be understanding of. And I think just um, acknowledging the fact that we're not wired the same way. We grew up in different backgrounds and the fact that people can be unintentionally racist. And I'm sure I'm racist in some ways. And I still co correct myself in my head. Like I grew up in a pretty like homogenous society. J Japan is very homogenous. There's only like, they're not only, but there's not a lot of international people. And there's not a lot of half biracials like me. There's not a lot of foreigners in there. Everyone like is basically from Japan and their parents are from Japan. So just like that, it. I think I have in, ingrained in myself some racist views that I have to co constantly correct. And I think we have to be understanding the fact that we're not all perfect and we all we all have things to work on. Whether you be a minority or a white person, we all have those assumptions and like biased views of other people that we we really have to work on. And I think it's just, I think going back to what are your intentions? Do you want to connect with people? Do you want to build genuine like connections? Do you want to improve yourself? I think those are the real questions that we should be asking. Yeah, thank you. Tara, thank you so much. There's so much there. And you talk about racism in Japan, the country where you were born and racism here and how it can be both macroaggression and microaggression and how it can layer on and build over time. You also address intersectionality so very powerfully, where we have overlapping issues of race and gender and identity and class all, all merging together. Thank you for that. Um, our final panelist this evening, uh, before we open it up more largely to questions and answers from the audience is from Aldi Prianto, who was a student here, um, undergrad, grad, and now works here at Nazareth and Alumni Affairs. Aldi. Thanks, Nevin. Uh, thanks, everybody, for having me here today. And um, well, everyone said the bar high for what I have to say now. So. Um, but I think I'm just gonna start with, you know, sharing a little bit about myself. Um, I am, I work at NAS now in alumni engagement, but like Nevin said, I was a student. I started out in 2004. It's, it took me a little bit um, to graduate um, and then I left and then I finally came back here for my grad studies in the HESA program, which is the higher education program here at Nazareth. Um, I was born and raised in Jakarta, Indonesia, uh, which is uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, I moved here when I was 15. Um, I moved to Brighton. Um, I love to share this anecdote because when my mom, if, he, if you're not familiar with Jakarta, Jakarta is the capital of Indonesia. So it's a huge city. Um, <clears throat> when we, um, my mom told us that uh, we were moving here, uh, she said that we're moving to New York. And I was like, oh, wow, New York City, it's going to be cool it's going to be awesome it's going to be great it's going to be big um and then i got here on a wednesday night um to rochester new york which is quite 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 shocking at first um um having that expectation but so yeah so i came here from indonesia indonesia similarly to japan is very hom homogeneous in terms of ethnicity but in terms of um, cultures, languages, because of the nature of the country itself. Um, it's, in, uh, it's made up of 13,000 islands and islands evolutionarily you're separated by these natural barriers and folks are very different. You know, there are hundreds of languages in Indonesia, there are hundreds of costumes, you know, traditional garbs, um, food, you know, like there's a lot of variety and 
but there is still inter-ethnic tension, you know. So racism to ethnic Chinese in Indonesia is it was when I was growing up was very prevalent. Um, and so I came from a group, uh, you know, the oppressor, I guess. Um, one one way to say it, I came from the more dominant group. And um, when I came here, uh, sure enough, I I am part of the minoritized group. Um, so my own identity, I see myself uh, as a one and a half generation um, immigrant, which means um, you get here, you move here when you're um, as a teenager. Um, and that's pretty much how it was, you know. Uh, I came here when I was 15, it's been 20 years now. I just pretty much shared my age. Um, and I also identify as a, a first generation student um, when I came to college student, when I came to Nazareth. Why is that? Is because my mother got her master's in Indonesia in an Indonesian system, but that system is completely different from here. Um, and she was unable to help me when I came here and I had to really figure out my own way um, here. Um, and same with when I came to Nazareth, I came in the spring semester because I didn't really want to go to college. I wanted to play music in a band. Um, but then my mom's like, you have to go to college. <laughs> so here, I, you know, and then I went. Um, I started in the spring and it, it was, I, you know, there wasn't um, orientation. So I kind of just jumped into, you know, my first class, um, uh, 8 a.m. in the morning with Dr. Thibodeau for Western Civilization One. Um, and, you know, so it, it was pretty shocking. Um, and, but at that time, there's been some time since I moved here and, and getting to know uh, a little bit more about American culture. And, and, you know, there's some, as I'm going through, like listening to some folks sharing their stories, um, there are some themes that I, I wanted to address. One of them is language. Um, you know, Tara shared the, 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 um, that she doesn't have uh, an accent. And that's something that I worked on uh, for myself because, you know, having an accent is often equated with lesser, um, um, uneducated, because that's how my mom felt. You know, she was, she has her master's and she felt like she was nobody when she was here because she can speak um, English as well as I could. Um, and, and that's, that's very, and that leads to the discussion of being invisible, right? Trying to kind of like, you know, one thing that we have to say about Asian Americans is that we have benefited from our privilege. Um, we are able, for the most part, I'm not saying this as, as a gen general thing, but for the most part, we are able to exist under the radar. And I, I've experienced that myself, you know, um, and I've definitely took advantage of it. And it's not something that I'm proud of, but it was so, it's something that happened and I did. Um, and that is a problem in itself because we're kind of mitigating all these issues, you know, microaggressions, that's, that's like daily occurrence, <laughs> it, you know, it, it wasn't, and it's not okay, regardless, regardless of intention, you know, impact over intention is very, it's key, you know, and, and I, I don't, well, I, I feel like I tend to in the past to just kind of like brush it off and like, oh, maybe I'm overreacting, but, you know, over time, like Tara said too, you know, it's mosquito bites, they accumulate and they cause real harm. And that's not, that's not okay. Um, and, and I think it is our responsibility as a, as, a, as a minoritized group too, to uplift and support um, other mi minoritized groups uh, in our society here. Um, and we haven't done enough of that, I think. And while this, I, I think since the reckoning, uh, the time, the national reckoning last year of all the awful things that happened, um, I, I think it's becoming, folks are becoming more and more comfortable sharing and, and voicing their support of each other. And that's why it's, it's quite unfortunate when we see some of these um, crimes against folks in the um, AAPI community becoming more prevalent um, in the past year or so. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot, again, it's just such a complex 
discussion and and i'm interested to see what folks are, are what questions are coming up and and what we can talk about um <clears throat> but you know again language invisibility while actually being visible because you can't hide the skin color or how we look um intention or impact over attention our complicity um as a minoritized group to other minoritized group and and how can we move forward as a society as a community especially here at nazareth to make sure that we acknowledge difference we celebrate difference but at the same time be honest about issues that still exist and how do we address that as a community thank you Aldi, thank you so much for that. I think collectively, if we look at what all five of our panelists have said, the broad range of experience that people have had, some positive experiences and some quite painful negative experiences and some small deaths by a thousand cuts of the microaggressions, it's, it's all evidence of how we have to do better than we're doing and how do we do that in such an imperfect multicultural society? But I think all of us are here tonight because we want to do better than we've been doing and figure out how to move forward. So this is a, a perfect time to sort of open it up now to questions from the group, from the audience. And if you would like to ask your questions, Hava will serve as sort of a a moderator of those questions and pass them forward to me and then I can pose them to the panelists. There, there's one that came in while we're waiting, you know, for everyone to start sending them in now. And it was for Dr. Jang. Um, somebody asked, what about Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia? Just finished with Aldi. She, and they said there aren't many in America um, were, were these groups also refused or discouraged to come to America at some point? Okay, yeah, and I just noticed that, you know, I make some here, and then so here I, I left out, you know, so this is the line here, yeah, this is the line here. And so I'm going to keep this very short, yeah. It's fair to say that all the group here that I'm referring to, that's um, few, you know, they, they sent, um, so few immigrants came from these countries, you know, this, this number of countries that I listed under 1965, yeah. So then the Indonesia, Malaysian, and then the Thai, yeah, they mostly, you know, the, the bigger wave, bigger wave did not start until the early 1980s and uh, like the late 1970s to early 1980s. And so mostly it came on the base of professional, you know, professional skills. Yeah. And for instance, like Filipino, a lot of the, a lot of the in health industry. Yeah. And same, you know, same for Indonesian, Malaysian, yeah, and Thai people. So because it came after 1965, as I said, it's a watershed. Yeah, it's a watershed. So it was not legally, yeah, it was not legally discriminated or legally excluded. I wonder if that answered the question. Yeah, I think it did. I mean, there's there's a variety of ways um, we find exclusions, which were expressed by all the different panelists. Some of it is through the law or through government, you know. Others is is by the behavior of those around us and and the bias that develops and what we do to one another. Yes. So thank you. Quickly point out, I go back to the table here, and then so this information I just added, because here we are looking at the unfair laws. But we see this is one thing that you know is God bless America is that the the, con the country's ability to correct itself yeah you know over a longer period of time so the Chinese Exclusion Act yeah it was repealed in 1943 took long time 60 60 years and it was repealed in the middle in the Pacific War because China was the ally became the ally of the United States and then the Immigration Act you know that completely excluded. Asian was revised, yeah, in 1952. Essentially, took off, took off, you know, the, the, the Asian part there. And then executive order, this one that put, you know, Japanese American in the inter internment camp was officially rescinded by Jimmy Carter in 1976. 
yeah, in 1976. And then the last one, I said this one, the Immigration Nationality Act, which benefited Asian American, then established the dual principle of family reunification and an emphasis on professional skills. And this law stand all the way till today. Yeah. So I'm going to just end right here and to say that in the good, you know, what we call the silver lining is that this major law, yeah, this major law is still in place and still in place. And there hasn't been any legal act and try to reverse the course of 1965. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've got a question actually for Iris. Um, I know, Iris, when you started to speak, you, you said you wanted to sort of talk more largely about what was happening across the US rather than speak from your personal experience. Because so many people on tonight's uh, program didn't get a chance to hear you speak in the fall. I wonder if you'd be willing just to share a little bit about some of your own lived experiences since you've been in the U.S.? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, so um, after I came to the uh, United States, I've met a lot of people, um, my teachers, my friends, and um, just passerbys too. Um, and many of them were very friendly. And if you ask them the direction, they'll show you the way. And if you ask them questions, they will just um, answer you very kindly, but uh, sometimes, um, well, I didn't notice this before because I, I didn't grow up in an uh, atmosphere, I mean, environment like uh, United States. So some of this, uh, some of this um, I haven't experienced before. So I failed to define it at first. Sometimes this kindness will become one kind of microaggression. Yeah, like one of my uh, teacher, well, just um, when I'm answering a question or when she is about to ask me a question, if I didn't answer it in time, she would just be like, um, well, if it, it's okay if you don't know how to say it or like, it's okay if you don't know the pronunciation because you are not a native speaker. Uh, well, but the thing is I can learn even if I'm not a, a native speaker, I want to be given the, the equal opportunity of doing things, not only because I came from China, um, yeah, kind of stuff. And uh, sometimes when I was uh, walking on the street, I kind of in, encounter with some not very friendly gestures or words, and one of my friends were called Ching, and something like that before. It's just, um, it's not a good thing. And what's even worse is because uh, it's, um, at the beginning, I don't even recognize what it is because I haven't experienced it before because we don't have many ethnic groups in China as uh, in the United States. Yeah. I think that's, that's a key observation when you're coming from a largely dominant culture where you have one ethnic group that makes up, you know, in China's case, it's 92% of the population, which is pretty overwhelming percentage. And then you come and suddenly you realize you're a minority among many minorities. And there's a slim majority that's losing that majority status. Yeah. It's, it's all a new experience, how one navigates that. Mm -hmm. And, and, I thank you too for talking about how microaggressions can, um, they can be complicated because yeah. often it's out of an innocent uh, sense of actually trying to offer support, but it really just reinforces your alienation. Yeah, and um, the teacher, well, my teacher, I believe that she's very kind and she's very kind to me. It's just, um, she's still learning how to treat, um, well, a foreign student. Right. Yeah, I can understand. Well, we're all we're all learning, right? But <laughs> we have a lot of room to grow, for sure. Yeah. But everybody should be given the opportunity to learn. 
was there were a couple of questions that really um, any of the panelists could take. So just unmute yourselves. I'll, I'll kind of lump them together, but they wanted they were they're asking about the correlation, you know, between the law and government um, and what's happening like on the ground. You know, how how do we see the relationship between um, laws and government and and what happens in in reality for people every day? experiencing one another. So anyone who wants to take that can unmute and Tara, go ahead, Tara. You're fine. Um, I, I can't talk on the specific details because I haven't educated myself that much yet, but I think certainly when, especially during the Trump administration, I think a lot of um, international students um, were kind of, I think, um, like my sister, she was in the United States, she was looking for a job, um, but I think it was made really difficult because of the administration. So I think there was like a direct correlation between what the government does and what like the job um, opportunities or just the opportunities to stay in the United States do become like do vary between um, I think presidents and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I think um for example i think i applied for the lottery there's like this diversity program where you put your name in a lottery and um you had to get selected in order to be able to stay in the united states but the chances are very slim and i think it's made slimmer depending on who runs the government i think so those are i think things that would impact a person who's an international student but i'm not sure about um like asian americans or pacific islanders who are from the United States. Also, I'm sorry, this not has nothing to do with the questions, but um, I do have to go to a class now, so I'm just gonna say bye. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, bye. So to just a very quick note, yeah, executive order. So as I said, 1965, the, the basic law didn't change. It still stands. And so what happened is during the Trump administration, there was a series of executive orders, which is not just against Asian Americans. It's also, you know, for instance, the travel ban, the ban, you know, ban Muslims from entering the country. It takes one executive to rescind the order of the other. So the following president you know, is within their power to rescind the executive order of the previous one, just like Jimmy Carter rescinded the, the executive order of FDR. So I think, you know, right now the power lies in the current president, yeah. So there, there's one question that came in and I, I realized that we're running out of time, but I'd still like to ask the one question and sort of open it up. Many of you have spoken about um, accents and accent discrimination or, or because English is your second language, just sort of how that ends up separating. And accents, accents are a very unique attribute, not just of internationals coming to the United States, but there's, there's accents all across the United States. And there's perceptions of people who speak with maybe a heavy Southern accent and how they might be perceived within society. And so I wonder if, um, if, if any one of the panelists would be willing to sort of come back to this issue of accent, sort of knowing that, that it's a phenomenon in the US, even for Americans, and then you add in the complexity of international and, and coming with your accent, we're all speaking English, but yet it's different accents and, and how, how we're perceived as a result of that. Can I, Iris? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I became a little concerned about this at, um, at the beginning because um, the major I'm learning is acting. And uh, when I'm talking with my um, advisors and teachers, sometimes they will tell me that, um, well, you should be able to speak the American accent because if you want to act in the United States, um, well, it will kind of broaden your 
like um, opportunity of getting your jobs, sometimes um, something like that. Um, but they also told me that um, it's okay if you uh, like um, have your own accent because um, your accent is actually a part of who you are because uh, a part of um, where you grow up from and where um, and um, what you've experienced and what kind of people you are. Um, so my opinion is um, there should be no judgment. Like uh, you can absolutely choose to learn to speak American accent as long as you want to, but you shouldn't consider this as um, a must do or something that um, your own, yeah, and, and don't consider your own accent is something that you should get rid of because it is not, it's part of you. Um, but uh, when it comes to learning American accent, you should be, you should feel free if you want to. Like, <laughs> that's um, what I think. Just don't judge people <laughs> by their accent. Thank you for that. I, I wonder if, um, before I ask Ashley to speak, um, I'd like Tyler to sort of say a few words about uh, the, the data. What, what do the data show for Nazareth and particularly for the AAPI community as problematic as the data is? And if you wanna maybe talk a little bit about some of the federal classifications that we have to use, Tyler, and why, why we're limited by those federal classifications? Definitely. So my name is Tyler Mosley. I work here at NAS in institutional research. And actually the data is what prompted me to look more into the experience of Asian American and Asian students at NAS. Um, what I've been doing over the past few months is diving into all the numbers we have to try to look for obvious equity gaps, right? So maybe I could look in our experiential data and find that our Asian American students don't have as many opportunities to engage in leadership as their peers. But I didn't find that. And so I thought, okay, I'll look in our graduation or attention rates. And I found that as a group, our Asian American students had the highest first to second year retention rate. And I said, that, that's great, but that doesn't mean that everything's fine. Um, and this has prompted me to do a few things. One. Um, to try to share more information about that community in terms of the data we have, um, and to try to explain that data a little bit. So we as an office are required to report to a lot of state and federal organizations, right? Um, it's how we stay accredited. It's what you know, keeps us going and able to pass out degrees. As a, and I'm not going to say that this is a necessarily a good or bad thing, but a lot of folks are interested to find that Asian students are not considered underrepresented. They are considered minority students. Now, that's a federal definition. It's not something we made at NAS. And the assumption on this is basically saying that the population of a college should mirror the population of the community it's in. If you look at the um, total population of Asian Americans, and what percentage that is, there's actually more Asian Americans enrolled as a percentage in colleges and universities across the United States than there are in um, you know, the, the nation. And that's prompted a lot of great conversation. That's been something really great to reflect upon. But ultimately, what I decided to do is to ask around to get some more qualitative data. Um, I've had a few panels talking to our Asian students, trying to get their insight on some things. And Fortunately, I have not heard that there have been very hateful incidents here at NAS. Um, I have heard that folks have been asked to pronounce words that, you know, are in a language they've never spoken and have no affiliation with. Um, I have heard from folks that sometimes their culture, if it's celebrated, is distilled down to food, basically, in some of these events. And so, in a lot of ways, I think the story of our Asian American students is hard because it's just, it's something that can so easily fall off the radar because of that myth of the model minority. Because we think, oh, our Asian students have great GPAs and they're graduating at a great rate. 
and that's that's not the complete story. Um, and if anyone's interested in you know talking more about the work that I've done or engaging in this work, I'd I'd love to talk to you. Feel free to email me at any time. <clears throat> and I, I think to sort of dovetail upon what Tyler is saying, you know, NAS is bound to use these federally mandated classification systems. And when you come to a term like Asian, it, it really is a meaningless term. It's so broad. It's sort of everything that was not West Europe. And it goes from Lebanon all the way to Japan. And then it arcs around into the Philippines and Indonesia and Malaysia. It, it's a meaningless concept. And people often can't find themselves within that term, particularly when they're, when they're trying to come and they're checking off a box, you know, where do you belong? And I, identity is complicated and we need to figure out a better way to sort of capture who we are and not be bound by these classification systems. Ashley, I would like to um, ask you to address us as someone in the community and belonging division Absolutely. Um, I appreciate the invite to be here in this space. And I'm just so grateful to kind of hear from you all as it pertains to our panelists, but also those who have those additional questions. Um, using this space to speak and honor your truth, um, I, it's invaluable for our campus community. So I appreciate the brevity and, and the courage that goes into it. Um, so I'm here on behalf of Community and Belonging, but I'm also here as the co-chair for Nazareth's Bias Response and Education team. Uh, I co-chair this team with Dr. Jed Metzger, and we work alongside um, a variety of faculty and staff here on campus committed to this work um, and truly committed to, um, you know, really moving our culture towards a culture of transparency um, and, and proactive education and, and um, reconciliation. And so as it pertains to bias incidences in particular, uh, this team takes a reactive approach as it pertains to collecting any sort of bias incidences that have occurred. We do have a online site um, that has that reporting structure system through Maxient. Um, it is a confidential reporting process that is only made available to the actual team comprised of seven members. And then we have our proactive measures to how we actually approach bias on campus, which I would say is, is the most unique aspect of our team. We take a restorative justice approach in ensuring that we're prioritizing the voices of the individual harmed. Um, if we think about overall culture, typically, you know, overall culture as it pertains to a nation or even globally, um, we have tended in the past to prioritize the individual that harmed focusing on their intent, right? So Aldi kind of mentioned this, focusing on intent, but not necessarily focusing on impact. So that's the huge part about our, our, our approach. We focus on the individual harmed and we focus on the impact and the harm that has occurred as a result of this incident. And as a result of that, we ensure that we work with this individual harmed and in ensuring that we can at least um, uh, move towards reconciling the harm done. And this looks very subjective and looks very different depending on the person. Some folks may wanna take a more formal approach, maybe directing incidences towards HR, student conduct, things of that nature. But sometimes folks just wanna be heard. Um, you know, sometimes folks just want a conversation. They wanna to talk to the person that harmed them and, and provide some context as to why exactly this was harmful. So it really depends. We, we work in ensuring that we're accommodating to the needs of that individual. And so I wanted to speak on that today just as one of many resources Nazareth offers. Uh, this is an inaugural team. We just came out this fall, uh, no, this spring. Uh, so February 1st. And so, uh, you know, the, the complications of being an inaugural team is that we're really learning as we go. We want to be sure that this process is, is really adhering to the culture of our campus, which causes for many changes as we go along. And so once again, as we're talking about bias, as we're talking about microaggressions, I want to be sure that folks on this panel, folks in this call, know that we have a direct source um, that will intentionally approach harm and ensure that you're receiving the healing or, or at least um, navigating some sort of healing process, ensuring once again that your experience is equitable um, and, and your experience is, is just, right, and, and restorative. Uh, and I just wanna also mention that this is a team that is, this is a process or a system that is available to our students, faculty, and staff. 
And it is also available not only to someone who has experienced harm, but for someone who has witnessed harm as well. So if you've witnessed anything on campus or if you've heard from maybe an, uh, a third party or something of the sort, we, we strongly encourage folks to fill out this form. That way we have data. So going to Tyler's area, we have data. We know exactly what the needs are of our campus, what's happening on our campus, and we can really solve it on a systemic institutional level. I'll leave it as that. I know we're over time, but if you have any questions, please feel free to forward them to myself or Jed Metzger, the other co-chair. Thank you all again. It was great hearing from you, truly. Thank you so much, Ashley. And thank you again to all of our panelists, to Sam Song, Iris Yang, to Irene O, oh, to Tara Mutsiasu, and to Aldi Prianto for giving us of your time and of your yourself to share painful moments and some joyous moments and to help contextualize it both to Tyler and to Ashley and for our guest speaker to Elia Jong from the University of Rochester. We've only just begun this conversation. It's a scratch of the surface, but it's work that has to continue. And I'd really like to turn our closing remarks over to Dr. Mohammed Shafiq in our Center for Interfaith Studies and Dialogue. Shafiq, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fisher. And also I want to thank uh, Dr. Elia Zhang for uh, accepting our invitation and to be our guest speaker today. And to all, as you said, to all of our own speakers who said, uh, who have shared their experience with us. Now, this is very true, Dr. Fisher, we are living all of us as minorities, <clears throat> whether we are from Asia, whether we are Latinos, or especially African-Americans, we are living under radar. And it's a hard life. I wanted to share some of my personal story, but we don't have time. I want to give you just a little bit of history. I think when you look into American history, especially when uh, Protestant Christians uh, get hold of power in our country here, I think you can see from there onward how the um, uh, indigenous uh, Indian Americans were treated, the very land we live, what happened to them. You know, amazingly, when I take my students on experiential study to racial, cultural, and religious spaces, and when they go to Ganandigan and when they hear uh, the leader from there says, oh no, we, you know, Thanksgiving is not ours. Other things which they mention, why they not to celebrate Thanksgiving and other things. You know, the eyes of the students are wide open with this experience, or with, when they go somewhere else to other places. I would really like, if you would like to study this, uh, there is a book, Intolerance in America. It starts from there and then all ethnic and racial minorities and then religious minorities. When the Catholics came here, all they say, uh, oh, they're coming here again to uh, do this with us. I mean, you know, what happened during medieval period. Uh, uh, so how anti-Catholicism happened. I think uh, you remember everything until the 60s, uh, you know, to President Kennedy, what uh, some of the issues came along with that. Uh, then you can go to, um, um, you know, uh, anti-Semitism is there. And others, uh, you know, religious, how religious minorities and other racial and cu cultural minorities. When, what I was really stunned with uh, President Reagan when he used the evil empire. And then how the word evil nations, evil countries were used. I was really, really, you know, that was very painful for, I wrote about that. I was a student at, at Temple at that time. I wrote about that. It's then in my book also, which has been published uh, about this concept of evil empire. So anyway, what, uh, what I see is that uh, today, this is uh, the bias is not going to go away. I think I spoke uh, in quite a few places in the last few days. What we need is um, diversity education. Our responsibility to the next generation, what we can do. I think that's most important. I have offered uh, to some groups also that 
yes those who work in monroe county and the city of rochester this is our responsibility at least this in this area to do some certificate programs for for them in diversity and inclusion so these are things that really is very very painful and certainly for me uh things which has happened to me in my life i said this to once to fbi I mean, I used to have a lot of meetings with FBI because of the issues which are happening. Interfaith meetings were inviting them. I said, if I had known this, that this is a way I will be treated under the radar, I would have preferred to stay there in Pakistan at that time. But now I cannot go there. I lost my position. You know, I I was in a good position. I was full professor and chair of the department. So now I cannot go there. and i'm under radar here what shall i do and when it happened to my son he was coming from canada he's born in philadelphia i mean he's a native city i mean he's born in philadelphia uh so when they stopped him at uh, the coming from canada at the check post uh, border for 3 hours we were not hearing from him we were so frustrated and i actually started to go and my wife and my other kids were we were all what is going to happen to him? why he is not answering did he got into fatal accident he was just for nothing he was asked his uh, handcuffed and stay with the wall for 3 hours nothing and then they released him so anyway under radar this is our life uh sitting once dr fisher with african american intellectuals they said shafiq this is your turn now and now it is all of our turn because asians we are all of us from middle east to all the way to east asia we are all asians also so it's not going away i think the only way is education i hope uh, we can do something good through diversity and inclusive education to change the mind of people how to treat one another and how to be with one another thank you very much i really appreciate uh when hawa mentioned to me to do this program i took it serious along with her and we worked it out thank you all thanks thank you shafiq thank you dr shafiq and we all realize we only just um scratched the surface here could have listened this could be a 10 part series listen to each each person has so much wisdom and so much to offer in the conversation so thank you thank you for also sharing your story a little bit there dr shafiq so good night good night everybody thank you everybody so i'm going to hit chat you all Hi Hana, I just sorry. I just I just want to thank you. Yeah. I just want to thank you for inviting me. Yeah. This is this is very meaningful. We, we don't have something like this in your bar yet. Wow. wow. Well, we, we, we'll take we, it on the road. Yeah, we'll take it on the road. I mean, you yeah. taught me this so is, so much information in your 14 minutes even. Like <laughs> No, it's um, my honor. Yeah, it's my honor. Yeah. And then so so yeah. So I I I try to dig into each ethnic group to see their their different trajectory. Yeah, and so don't don't worry. Yeah, maybe can be used in the future. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. but this but is so important because you're right. Everyone lumps everybody, and you, you know, as I said, each ethnic group got thirty seconds. You know, because there's so many. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So okay. I just want to say that. Yeah. Thank you so much. We really, really appreciate you yeah. being here. You're around. Yeah. Okay. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Bye.